am Sarah Shop. I obviously run TikTok therapy with I can see some familiar faces up in the box, uh, boxes, so you, um, hopefully you know mostly who I am. And then we're joined tonight with Lucinda Miller, um, who I'm actually going to allow to introduce herself because she'll do a much better job of it. And um, I really hope you enjoy what we've got coming this evening. I have to say I'm looking forward to it just as much as you guys um, because I've heard Lucinda speak before, um, which was fantastic. And I'm really looking forward to learning something myself. Over to you. So, hi everybody, it's lovely to meet you. I think there's a couple of people I know, so it's great to see you again. Um, I'm Lucinda Miller. I've been practicing as an naturopath for about 20 years. And what really got me into this was a, my son who had tics, dyspraxia and ADD. Um, and um, yeah, it was, we found it really hard. You know, he was having a really tough time and we knew that um, there were lots of things that we could do nutritionally and I'd always done nutrition, but I think what it was, was the difference was trying to get focused for him. And I actually went to an autism conference and even though he wasn't, he didn't have autism, I was looking after a few kids with autism and I kind of just saw just a few links, like I knew there was a big link between the gut and the brain at that point. Anyway, I went there and there were some fantastic doctors from America and they really just changed my whole perspective on things. I cried all weekend and I thought I, I can I know I can do this for my son so um, I ordered up various tests and things for him to do and it came up with quite a lot of things going on in the gut a bit of toxicity etc so we worked on that very gently and literally within a couple of weeks he woke up one morning and said and he started getting really organizing his homework together and getting his breakfast and had actually his uniform on which never happened before because he really disorganized and um, I said what's going on and he goes Mummy, my brain's not playing hide and seek anymore. I can concentrate. And he sort of said it was like his brain had a few people to find before his brain worked like the other boys. And every few months he said, I can see one around the corner. And then he go, found him. Anyway, he's doing very well. He's actually, if, I'm sorry about some noises off. There's a bit of drilling going on, but my husband's in here outside <laughs> building a little patio. <laughs> so I apologise for that. Um, but yeah, he's 19 years old. He's ex to university. He's got a lovely girlfriend. He's a really cool guy. So yeah, we've, he came on a long way because at that point they were thinking of him going to a special school because his you know, writing was so difficult and so forth. So he's come a long way. And actually the ticks went away really quite quickly. So it wasn't a big thing for him, but it's something I do understand really, really, I found really, really upsetting. Um, and um, so that's something that I connected with Sarah about. Um, so anyway, um, I, as I said, I've been a naturopath anyway, and I just started seeing more and more kids who had these presentations. And um, I've now built quite a big team. So we've actually got 14, nature docs dotted around the country and six of us specialize in autism, pounds, pandas, ticks, threats, etc. And quite a lot of those members of my team are parents who've been through this journey. Um, and, um, you know, they've known exactly what it's like to go through it. And I think it's really important to have experienced that because you can have the best knowledge in the world, but actually realizing the nitty gritty of how you get a child to change their diet, how to get supplements into them, and Sarah knows, you know, I'd like to get all the, you know, the different therapies in and so forth. It can be really tough. And I think, you know, if you've lived through it, then it's, it's better. Um, and you're more, you can really connect with the parents. So, yeah, we've been very busy over the last uh, 20 years building this. And it's been really, really exciting. I wrote a book a couple of years ago, um, which is a very general cookbook for families. But the underlying sort of message from it um, is preventing something called inflammation and that's really the key that I want to talk to you about today. Um, so it, what, what's inflammation got to do with your children's ticks? What's inflammation got to do with their um, ADD? What's it got to do with their dyspraxia? What's it got to do with their pounds? Well the, we all know about acute inflammation. Acute inflammation is when you burn your hand or you twist your ankle and it damn well hurts, it goes red, raw, and it really throbs. And during the time it's healing, you know you can't use it very well, you know you've got to compromise to, you know, say washing up, you can only use one hand or whatever. Um, and, um, and during that time, however upbeat and jolly you are, you will feel a little bit down during that time because your body is sending so much energy to healing that. 
but you just can't quite do the same. It's such a minimal amount. It's not going to change your ability to do your work or etc. but you're just not going to do it with such enthusiasm because it's, you know, you know, your body's doing something. So that's acute inflammation. And usually within a few days or a week or so, your body is healed and you've forgotten about it entirely. You know, it's gone, you're playing tennis again, you're you know, going scooting to work, whatever you're doing, it's all back. However, on a daily basis, we all get these little injuries. Now, many, 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 many injuries that go on every day. And those are all sorts of things from being stressed, eating the wrong food, being dehydrated, not sleeping enough. And then you've got some biggies like um, infections. They drive inflammation. So if you have a virus, can you hear? Can you hear? Yeah. No? Okay. Sorry, I just heard someone. Um, so if you have a virus, for instance, you might get a red rash or you know this COVID virus, people are getting the lung inflammation. Um, so, um, there, and then you've also got little mini, mini injuries from toxins in the environment. So every time you breathe in pollution, every time there's toxins in your environment, so that could be anything from cleaning products to deodorant, etc. cetera. There are little toxins in there, little, little chemicals that we shouldn't have necessarily. Um, now, if we've got really good genetic the background, you know, really strong genes, alpha genes, then we can probably cope with that. And that's why some people can live off McDonald's every single day and kind of do okay. But there are an awful lot of us and there are, genetics are extremely complex, but a lot of us hold these genes that predispose us to autoimmunity, predispose us to inflammation, predispose us to not being able to break down nutri nutrients efficiently, etc. And no one really knows what genes you're going to have. And actually, it's such a, it's, you know, I mean, it's just, I mean, they know of many, many thousands of genes, but there are millions and millions of people that still don't know. So it's all very complex. But the ones that they, for instance, if we do do a genetic profile, it's a 60 page profile. And it's looking at probably five, 600 genes. And I would say, the most of them are looking at, is this person prone to inflammation? Is this person, um, pr you know, these underlying, this underlying chronic inflammation? And there are many different drivers of this. As I said, some people can eat McDonald's every day absolutely fine, but they cannot touch a glass of wine. That just can't cope, they just can't cope. From a children's perspective, you might have a child who does incredibly well drinking dairy and others who will break out in eczema, which is an inflammatory condition from just having a tiny drop or an allergic reaction, so to a nut. So we are all wired differently too. And um, some of that is controlled from, um, you know, pregnancy and the early years. And I'm gonna talk a bit about that in, in a while. Um, but there's also, as I said, this genetic thing. So we don't know what our kids have inherited and we don't know because what's happened is we've always had these genes. Those don't, haven't changed, but what has changed is the environment. And the environment's got tougher on those genes. So ones that weren't expressed before are now being expressed a lot more now. So for instance, inflammation is linked to almost all our current modern day diseases. So we're looking at heart disease, we're looking at type one diabetes and type two diabetes. We're looking at obesity, we're looking at arthritis, we're looking at eczema, asthma, ADD, autism, tics, Tourette's, you know, it's all inflammatory based. And there's a huge amount of research on this. If you go, if you go onto PubMed, which is the sort of big um, library of all the scientific journals that have ever been published and type in inflammation, you will just get thousands and thousands. Just on one area, which is the gut microbiome, which is so important, you'll look at 15,000, which were published just last year. So there's a huge amount. Now, the problem is that this research has not been turned into, it's not been turned into useful actual therapies in terms of what the paediatricians will do right now or the psychiatrists will do right now. And one of the reasons that has happened is that there is a book called the DSM book which divides mental health and physical health. So historically doctors have been divided into two. You've got head doctors, the psychiatrists and body doctors which are the, the physical doctors. And they can't really talk to each other. So anything in the DSM book, which is this manual of all the mental health issues, and that includes ticks, Tourette's, pandas, just, you know, all sorts of 
oppositional defiance, you know, you've got depression, psychosis, everything's in there. If it's under that banner, then a physical doctor cannot treat that condition. And they will not look out of the box to see if it's actually an immunologically based issue or a gastric based issue or an allergic based issue or a histamine based issue or, or an infection based issue. They, they don't do that. So all the psychiatrists have, so the head doctors have, are talking therapies and medication. And that's where, and you've obviously got lovely TikTok therapies as well, which is great. Um, but those are the things that have had to be born out of individuals like Sarah, who's wanted to be able to help her child. It's not something that you would get from a paediatrician. You would not get these therapies from there. And this is the frustrating thing. And this is where we get very passionate about it because we're looking at a situation where you've got, I guess these things eventually will go in, but there's just, the, the NHS, for instance, is so crowded out by you know, diabetes, COVID, et cetera. They just don't have the bandwidth to suddenly go, oh, let's change the diet for these kids or let's put this vitamin. It's just beyond them. And remember, physical doctors, um, medical doctors, they probably only do about four hours of nutrition in the whole of their training. So it's something they're not confident with either and they haven't been taught. It is changing. And what's happened is Bristol University, the medical school there, have started up something called NutriTank, which is educating medical doctors or medical students on nutrition. And that's been rolled out to a masses of different um, universities, um, medical schools. And that is bringing in a, hopefully a wave of new doctors who have a slightly different view on lifestyle and so forth. So going back to inflammation, um, as I explained, inflammation can come from all the things, you know, we all know why we should sleep well. We all know why we should eat well. We all know why we should exercise. We all know why we should drink water. But we don't know that it all ties together in this underlying condition. Um, so what can happen, it's like a little fire is burning inside every single time you get one of these little injuries that go in. And as I said, if you have a good night's sleep, um, if you eat well, um, if you learn to de-stress or, um, you know, etc., then or you've got good genetics, then you're going to cool down that inflammation quickly. And so your body's going to go back to its normal. So, but if you've got this genetic sort of background where there's maybe you've got autoimmune condition or your husband has or your parents or, you know, there's heart disease or diabetes or just something like that in the family, then it's likely that um, there is some sort of inflammatory genetics in there. And then you add in the environment and the environment is really complicated. And I don't like pointing fingers at specific things because it's just too much. But basically we've been brought up to bring up, we've been educated to bring up our children in a very different way to how it was with our parents and grandparents and our great grandparents. So we used to eat a lot of whole food. We kids used to run around outside. There was lots of fresh air. There were less toxins in the environment, less cars, less airplanes, less stress, less no Facebook or Instagram. None of this. You know, there was a lot. Life was easier. And um, so what they found, it's just a little bit of everything. So this is why when you're helping your child with whatever presentation they've got, whether it's, as I said, the autism or the tics or the Tourette's or the ADD or the dyslexia or the ODD or whatever it might be, you've got to think, how can I just sort of always pair our lives back to things that are a little bit more simple? So the diet that is seen to be the best in terms of generally reducing inflammation is called the Mediterranean diet. I think everyone's heard of that. And you just imagine being in Greece or Turkey and eating lots of lovely fish and veggies and olive oil and you know, just very simple foods that have been home cooked. Um, and even though there's, you know, the Greeks and the Turks and things have a lot of issues now because the kids have turned to pizza and they've turned to Coca-Cola, etc. Um, and there's less home cooking going on. Um, still, there's the Mediterranean diet as, you know, the core essence is very important. What we try and do in our clinic is to try and bring in more food rather than take them away. And we understand massively that when a child has a very inflamed brain, that they tend to cut off that ability to be flexible. 
and very often they get into this mode of only liking certain foods. So very typically the kids that come to see us are might be eating five or six foods only and that could just be you know Sainsbury's chicken nuggets not Tesco's but Sainsbury's, um, a certain waffle, maybe a banana, maybe a certain raspberry yogurt like a putty flu but nothing else. You know very very stuck and when they're most inflamed their brains are more narrow in terms of their food selection and as their inflammation goes down then we find that they broaden out. So one of our ideas is not to force them to eat different foods to begin with, it's to be clever. So obviously if they're very, very fixed on their specific, specific brands, which is very few kids, I would say, sometimes they're a little bit more flexible, they'll have a waffle, but it, you know, it doesn't matter which waffle it is. Is if they've got, if we've got, if they're literally stuck in five foods, we will put in other nutrients through, I mean, they're literally in, in water, hidden in their in their food that they've eaten hidden in the mashed banana whatever they're eating to just broaden their diet a little bit and you know therapies like sarah's to sort of calm them down and help with them sleep and just generally get them into a better mode but if they're eating a slightly expanded diet so we're looking at say pancakes waffles nuggets etc we i show you and in my cookbook that they're all there but basically sort of be healthier beige versions so for instance, I do a chicken, um, a um, carrot and poppy seed waffle, and it's got yogurt, it's got oats, it's got eggs. I mean, it's got a full meal in it. It's got carrot, it's got poppy seeds in it, but it's like a crunchy beige waffle and they love them. And the pancakes again, are called brain boost. And again, they've got loads and loads of different nutrients in. So actually, even if that's all they eat, you know, they've got protein, carbohydrate, they've got some minerals, they've got some vitamins, they've got everything in there. Um, the chicken nuggets have got ground almonds and lemon and um, some parmesan so they taste they're really tasty so there are different ways of getting these in and every week I have a newsletter um, which you can sign up it's everywhere on my website you can find it very easily um, we send out a recipe each week and that's very adaptable so I say well, look I mean, if your child happens to be allergic to dairy or happen to be you know, sensitive to gluten or is on a very restricted diet, um, it will give the other options in there. So there will be some things you like and some things you won't. And you know, even though we don't like hiding vegetables and it's good to have them obviously there on the plate, it's also important to get them in as well. So if there's a courgette and a brownie, that's great. It's better than buying the Tesco's brownie that has got a 12 month um, best before date, which has got lots of preservatives in and lots of foods in there that you don't recognize, well, ingredients that don't recognize as food. Whereas if it's a homemade brownie, at least it's got good solid ingredients. So if your child is very restrictive, the first step you can do is to try and cook from scratch as much as possible rather than buy the food. And the reason is that ultra processed food, which is basically the convenience food that we've all got used to buying, we're all guilty. So, you know, no one's perfect. It's all the food that's in packages already that we have to, we can just heat up or just take out the package and give it to our child. So some are great, some are easy, you know, something like an oat cake, of course, that's got oats and a bit of oil and some seeds or something in it. But you get more complicated, like a low fat Muller light corner, and you've got probably 35 ingredients. And I bet you the only one you recognise as food is sort of like a skimmed milk powder, and the rest will be emulsifiers, thickeners, colours, um, um, you know, flavorings, all these things, and those are pro-inflammatory. So if you want to get your child to reduce their inflammation in their brain, then um, it is really important to try and cook from scratch as much as possible and to just try and get whole foods in. So if your child is a milk drinker, go back to the blue top milk if you can. If they're used to the sort of green top milk, then just slowly change it over. Don't sort of immediately give it to them, but you know, because sometimes they don't like change very much. Um, and it's going in for maybe spelt flour instead of white flour and it's things like that it's all just changing things up a little bit I put lentils in the bolognese you know for instance smush them up so they don't even know they're in there so it's things like that it's making things a little bit healthier and you might want to do half wholemeal pasta and half white pasta to begin with or you know or that sort of thing just to slowly so one change at a time and always have something on the plate that they do like so otherwise that's really really hard for them because they'll just have a tantrum and then they won't eat it and then end up doing, eating a whole pack of biscuits instead which is really you know not not what you want um so i, I think that we've had quite a few people just join and i just want to i was going talking about inflamed brains and why it's so important and i just want to go back because i was talking about general inflammation 
but what's the link with the brain? So, um, as I said, we've got this little fire that goes on inside, which builds up if we get life wrong, if we get habits wrong, um, if we're, you know, get too many toxins in the environment, etc. wrong foods, wrong sleep patterns, etc. It all builds up. Um, but, um, and everyone thinks, oh, just that must affect the body. And, and for ages, everyone thought that there really was a Berlin Wall between your brain and, your, and, your, and the rest of your body, and there was just no link, and what you ate didn't affect your brain. Um, but intuitively, I've never felt that was right. And what's amazing is the head of psychiatry from Cambridge University, he's called Professor Edward Bullmore, came out with a book just before mine, the same publisher. So I was really spoiled. I was able to read his book before it was published, which is quite exciting. Um, and it's amazing. And um, it's not so focused on kids, but it's, the re it's called The Inflamed Mind, his book. And the reason it's called the inflamed mind is because he's talking about the very, very strong link between this chronic inflammation and depression and psychosis and various other things. And he mentions autism, he mentions ADD, et cetera. But the key study in that, that really blew my mind in that book, you know, because I read it all and I thought it was fantastic. It was talking about people with rheumatoid arthritis who also had depression when the rheumatoid arthritis got better or got improved, their depression lifted and all of that. And we think, yeah, this is all adults, but what about the kiddies? And anyway, he highlighted this study, which I went to read more about, and it's called the Avon study. And the Avon study tested four and a half thousand perfectly happy and healthy nine-year-old children. So these were kids without any issues, no underlying health conditions, they were just all tested for two inflammation markers. So they're blood tests. So one's called IL-6, which you can get done, but it's quite difficult to get done sort of just by your GP. And then something called CRP, C-reactive protein, which any, you will probably be run if your child got very, very sick. Um, and if you've got kids with pandas, they'll probably check CRP. Anyway, basically, there are two really important infl inflammation markers that can test for long-term inflammation rather than just acute inflammation. And... Basically, they found, they, then what they did was they got these nine-year-old kids, and as I said, they did the blood test. And then when, about 10 years later, they called them all in, and they got them to do a survey. And they basically found out how they'd been, what been going on with their health, what been going on with their minds, etc., over those 10 years. And those were the top tertials, so the top third of inflammation markers, so the really high inflammation markers, even though they were outwardly very well at the point, that point, but those that were high, went on to have depression, psychosis. They had um, all sorts of mental health problems by the time they were 18. And considering one in four 14 year old girls now are diagnosed with a mental health condition, some sort of you know, self-harm or anxiety or something serious, you know, it's really big. So this could have been predicted many years before it actually manifested. And I thought, wow, that is massive. Anyway, I've got um, a cousin who's a psychiatrist in London, and she is a researcher. And she said, yes, this A1 study is so important that they're looking at the data to test other things too. So they're using, because it it's such a big amount of data, it's very hard to get four and a half thousand healthy kids. You know, it's much easier to get a cohort of a hundred people with asthma or something, it's, you know, whatever. So anyway, they found that the, 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 those with the high inflammation markers were also more prone to eating disorders, suicide risk, but there's also a link with this chronic inflammation with PANS, PANDAS, dyslexia, dyspraxia, ODD, all the things that I think your kids, you know, we, we did a survey before this and you all came out with lots of different things. So I know we've got lots of different conditions, but underlying, it is thought that a huge number of them have got a little bit, you know, they've got this chronic inflammation. And if you think about it, it's been bubbling away for a long time before. So for instance, if you've got a child who was doing really well, you know, a really thriving kid who suddenly sort of started to regress in their skills or started with the ticks, etc., it could have been bubbling away a while before. And the number of people that I speak to and they say, well, I think he probably was blinking a bit after he had a gastroenteritis when he was about three, but we didn't notice and it went within a week. But this one's really been going on, you know, and now we've got the grunts and now we've got the, you know, the, you know all sorts of little ticks or whatever or I talk to the pandas parents and they say yeah you know what he he wasn't very well when he was two and I did notice that he just wasn't he was just really grumpy and just not right for a week or so but I just assumed he was unwell but looking back that could have been a mild pandas flare 
So anyway, what, it, what this message is to all of you is that um, we need to understand, this is what we do in our clinic, we understand what the drivers are of inflammation for your child individually. Because as I said, it's a really complex web of different things. And as I said, it could be food, it could be sleep, it could be gut, it could be nutrition, it could be infection, it could be toxins, it could be all sorts of things. Sometimes it's a combination of all of them. And that's the really, really tricky, challenging ones. And often the ones with, the, I guess, the most heightened issues tend to have a bit of everything. It's like a blimming you know, jigsaw puzzle. And you're just like, oh my gosh, we've got to deal with that and this and that and that. But what we can often do is like, balance one area and sort of say right we've done that we'll do a bit of support going forward but we'll keep we'll sort that little area like the gut out first and then you know we'll work on the anxiety and then we'll work on the sleep you know we work on different areas and sometimes you go yeah we've nailed that bit she they've really progressed with that but then there's another area which is still you know outstanding and it's often that really you know, the really really difficult one that's right there at the end and i'm sorry we do our best but that's the one that's the most pronounced so testing wise, we tend to, we, as you know, often people have come to see us having been to see a pediatrician and seen a psychiatrist, they might have had some basic blood. So we definitely look at those to see whether their, their nutrition is sufficient from a very basic perspective, because often these tests are looking at vitamin D, iron, B12, folate, etc. And I love doctors to bits. We work very closely with a couple of pediatricians, work very closely with psychiatrists, with neuro neurologists. So fantastic. But very, very often from a GP's perspective, they tend to go, oh, it can't be that. So for instance, we often have iron levels, which are just borderline. So they're not actually anemic. But for a child's brain to really thrive and get that, because iron transports oxygen to the brain and it's really anti-inflammatory. So without enough oxygen going to the brain, guess what, and enough iron going to the brain, guess what, your child is not going to be working 100%. So we just look at things like that. We see, you know, what are the blood, red blood cells doing? What are the ferritin levels? And if they haven't been done properly, and your child's not too scared of needles, then we will, you know, obviously get those done. So we just want to know baseline, but often, as I said, this has been done, and they've often been told they're normal, and then we look at them and we go, they, yeah, your child hasn't got cancer, they're not about to die, you know, they're not ill in hospital, but they're not, it's not perfect. So we work on that, we can see signs of zinc deficiency, for instance, we can see um, signs of B12, folate, etc. So we can see quite a lot in those bloods. Um, and um, so, and then what we tend to do from there, and it, you don't have to have done those, as I said, there are other ways of finding out things that are really tricky to get non-blood wise are iron and vitamin D. So you do need those pretty much. I mean, you can sort of look at iron through hair, but it's not perfect. And you can get ideas whether vitamin D is low through other tests, but you can't get the exact number. So we often run something called a one test, um, which is actually about to change its name to metabolics test, metabolonics test, I think it is, if it's going to be exactly the same, it's a urine test. And this checks for 77 different metabolites. And those metabolites are basically all the drivers of inflammation and stroke autoimmunity. So autoimmunity and inflammation are very much intertwined. Um, and I'm very happy to answer questions on that later because people might sort of see, have seen a link, but it gets a bit complicated. So I'm just going to step back and just say that um, we're looking at all the drivers that can drive this autoimmunity, this inflammation. So it, it, it includes malabsorption of nutrients so is the gut your child you're feeding your child a brilliant diet so often the parents say look we're doing this perfect organic amazing diet and they're still got issues and we do tests and we find that they're just not absorbing and extracting the nutrients from the foods they're eating so what's going in isn't going and feeding the brain and we call these kids um, kids with starving brains or kids, kids with hungry brains it's almost like they're, and that's often why they're craving lots of things like sugary things because it's just like their brain just feels empty and they just want to be able to feed it and often sugar will give it a hit but it's not actually what they need it's probably they're craving magnesium or iron or zinc or something like that but so the gut is really important we spend a lot of time talking about the gut um and i'm going to talk about stool test in a minute but i'll just go through so malabsorption we, it gives a good idea on whether there's a bacterial infection or a yeast infection. 
So bacterial infections can very much drive, so you've got streptococcus, which is a big anxiety, OCD, pandasy kind of infection. Um, and then you've got clostridia, which is more of the autism and oppositional kind of bacteria. And that, it shows those two quite, quite clear. Well, sort of, you know, it gives us hints that those are there. Yeast infections often make them very giggly, silly, hyper, as if they're a bit drunk. Because yeast um, basically ferments in the gut and, cause, and, and makes ethanol, and of course ethanol is alcohol. So it's almost like they're a bit sort of hung over and a bit up and down, and they sort of often very upsy downsy and giggly and silly and then grumpy and just really unpredictable. So yeasty kids tend to be yeah, a little bit more crazy. Then um, it also checks for something called mitochondria, and the mitochondria are basically the batteries inside all your cells which control your energy. So they're often the kids with hypermobility, so a little bit floppy, get very tired, sweaty heads, um, you know, just um, often a little bit more neurologically challenged, um, but they can come in the chronically fatigued kids. So the ones that are always very tired, can't cope with school, always needing a nap, etc. cetera. Um, so mitochondria is really, really important. Um, then it looks at your neurotransmitters. So it will look as, is this low dopamine? or high dopamine, are we looking at low ad adrenaline, cortisol axis, or high, you know, have you got this sort of hyper state, or we've got a very low state, serotonin. I would say that 90% um, of the kids that we see have high serotonin, and that's often why they don't respond to antidepressants. So a lot of the kids are put on these antidepressants, and they don't do very well, um, because they've actually got this genetic thing called MAL-A, which drives their serotonin up. And it often, if they've got sort of, um, so with autism there's often a stimming where there's sort of they flap their hands and they have to repeat things and OCD is often quite stimmy too. Some OCD really really does kids do very very well on serotonin absolutely do great but a lot don't and if they don't then this is a really important test to look for. We do the absolute opposite which will do the calming stuff like magnesium and you know, actually making sure they don't have, you know, we really reduce that whizzing up serotonin. So it's a genetic thing. It gives us all the markers for all the B vitamins, B1, B2, B3, B6, B9, B12, all these really important vitamins. Um, it also looks for toxicity. So it gives a pollution marker and it gives a plastic marker, which, you know, the, apparently we all consume the equivalent of one credit card of plastic each week. Because every, you know, all everything's coated in plastic these days, so um, it's quite difficult to avoid entirely. But at least it gives us an idea of whether you need to reduce that in your life. Um, and again, pollution, and we find pollution just as bad in Scotland as it is in London sometimes. And sometimes it's just like you can't believe someone lives in an island and they've still got this pollution. It tends to be less there, but you know, it's extraordinary where it crops in. And it shows a liver marker just to see how well the body is actually detoxing those and whether it's efficient or not. Um, there's um, a concept which is a little bit more detailed called methylation, and I'll try and keep it really simple. Methylation is your body's ability to break down nutrients like B12 and folate into the usable form, so into the food-based form. Um, and basically there's a massive sort of pathway called methylation, which ends up producing this master antioxidant and antioxidants are the things that keep us young and vibrant etc this master antioxidant called glutathione and glutathione is the thing that protects us from autoimmunity chronic inflammation cancer all the big stuff yeah so if there's any fault along the way in that methylation cycle then it's not going to produce it efficiently so we, we, that's why it's so important to look at all the B vitamins. But there's these markers to say whether you need extra help with that or not, or whether you can just go in with plain diet and supplements, or whether you need this extra very specialist support. Um, you've got then all the amino acids, so protein structure. So kids tend to be drawn to carbohydrate and actually getting carb, um, protein into them is, can be very, very hard. So that would just assess how we're getting on with that. And in there, again, there's some complicated sort of areas of getting very specialists into um, the sort of you know neuropsychiatry side but there's one area I just want to highlight it's called glutamate so we've all heard of monosodium glutamate and actually majority of the foods have actually taken them out because it's been linked to it's not actually that closely linked to um, hi, um, hyperactivity but it has been linked to allergies and things so um, it used to be in skips and all that sort of thing but actually even monster munch and stuff have, 
basically taken them out now. But what they've done is they've replaced them with glutamate-like substances. So um, these natural flavorings are the things um, and other flavorings and like crisps, you know, look at all the different ingredients you go, my God, what's that? Um, and it sort of, you know, it sort of sounds naturalish, but you're still not quite sure. But they're, they're extracts of these foods, which are the same chemicals as the artificial ones. And they're basically supersonically concentrated. And that supersonic concentration acts on the brain as if it was MSG. So the, everyone's getting masses of MSG, but it's not called MSG anymore. So it's hidden. It's yeast extract is the big one. So everyone thinks of Marmite. It's in every, almost every stock cube. It's in flavoured crisps and flavoured crackers and things like that. Just look out for it. Now, again, it's such a difficult diet to follow that, again, this is why this test is quite important to look out for. Um, because if you do need to go stretch, it really means you need to cook from scratch all the time, um, which is hard. And there are ways of balancing. We can get there eventually. But what we find is the glutamate kids tend to be from the very intelligent family. So often, you know, grandpa's been a professor or, you know, uncle's a doctor. It's that kind of, you know, because glutamate actually makes your brain go bing, 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 and it makes it very, very sharp. But if you add in the modern diet with all these really, really highly concentrated glutamate rich foods, it's going to often turn it slightly, make it go just too fast. And this can cause a calcification of the brain, which gets it shut down, become more rigid and more black and white and often more hyper. Um, it also makes kids very risk taking. So there's a big link between glutamate and big teenage behaviours. So if your kid, you know, is the sort of kid that started, you know, trying to jump off <laughs> walls or, you know, is really, you know, going to be running across roads and you can't control, it could be a glutamate thing. And we calm with the opposite, which is GABA. So GABA is your cool, your calm, your relaxed, your chilled out person. Um, we, it's things like um, oats and yogurt and um, green tea and chamomile tea and things like that are very GABA rich. Um, there are supplements you can give it, but it's really quite, you know, just to balance things to begin with. And then the testing goes on and it, and it looks at something called oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is where you, your child basically hasn't had enough root and veg for them. Um, even if you think they're eating their five a day, they probably need more. But it's all about getting those lovely rainbow of different foods in every day. So it's all the berries and the broccoli and the brightly coloured foods. So we really work on that. And you can also put in antioxidants. Now, interesting, there's a load of research on antioxidants known as polyphenols or neuropsychiatry. And there are lots of these lovely natural elements. That, so things like blueberry extract, <laughs> blackberry extract, um, green tea extract, turmeric, um, saffron, and they've all got hundreds and hundreds of research papers. So saffron and something called pycnogenol, which are um, saffron you'll have heard of because that's in um, things like paella, um, but pycnogenol is a sort of a pine bark extract. And um, both of them are really good for the ADHD sort of presentation. And both of them separately have been trialed for ADHD versus Ritalin, and they've performed as well as Ritalin without the side effects. And so what we usually suggest is if, if a child is on Ritalin is to keep on that, but you know how you tend to have the break at the weekend or the break in the summer holidays is to trial the saffron or the pycnogenol then, because that's when you're going to see, ah, oh, okay, my child is easier to manage just generally. Cause it's not, it's, again, it's not got that window. It's more of a general focus. It's not like, you know, between breakfast and, and, and four o'clock, they're going to concentrate. It's more general. So it's lovely and you can then sort of make that decision later on um, whether you want to continue. And that's what's so great about Ritalin. It's not one that you have to take all the time. I mean, obviously it takes time to build up right at the beginning. Um, but we, we encourage to work together with psychiatrists um, to make sure that, you know, the child is getting the right support. But sometimes they do get that big, well, oh, I don't think they need it anymore. I think something's, you know, they've grown up out of that and it gets rather exciting. Um, so there are all these things that you can do um, to help. Now, information, um, I'm going to talk for about five more minutes and then it's going to be question time because I've got a million questions. So sorry, I've been wishing on, but I think it's really important to get the baseline of how we work. So I just want to talk about the gut because the gut is absolutely the most important area of a child's health if you want to help them from a neuropsychiatric perspective. Um, 
So there, as I said, last year, there were over 15,000 papers um, published on the gut microbiome. And the gut microbiome is basically this amazing forest of different bugs and bacteria and viruses and everything in your gut. Billions and billions and billions and billions of them. Um, and we've got them all over. We've got them through you know, noses, ears, all, all over our skin, in genital areas. We, we've all got lots of different microbiomes. There's also microbiomes in the soil. There's microbiomes everywhere. These are these colonies of tiny, tiny, usually we're talking about bacteria. Um, and if it's diverse and if it's got the right balance of the right ones in there, a child will, it will basically modulate inflammation. It will reduce inflammation and it will help the gut to extract the nutrients from the food your children are eating so that they're going to make it more efficient. So for instance, lactobacillus um, helps us digest milk. And there are lots of kids we see on spectrum with some neuropsychiatric presentations who've always been dairy free. They didn't do well as a baby. They had reflux, they were put on neocate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the parents are sort of, oh, they've sort of grown out of this now and they're on normal dairy, but actually then the ear infections come and then they're put on antibiotics. And then of course that wipes out the lactobacillus and the lactobacillus is needed to digest the milk. So then they become more milk intolerant. Anyway, you get this, this cycle. Now what's really interesting is lactobacillus, which you'll have heard of, it's in yogurt. It's the one that most people have heard of. It's in almost every probiotic. But lactobacillus is the building blocks for two very important brain hormones. One's called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is important for memory and learning. It's very important for your executive function. It's very important for working memory and processing. And when you know that um, kids with dyslexia, kids with dyspraxia and kids with ADD, have very poor processing and very poor um, working memory. And you look back and think, oh my God, they were the kid that always had antibiotics for ear infections or you know, were dairy free, so they weren't getting it through the diet. And so anyway, you can get choline from other areas. You can get from eggs, you can get from liver, seafood, meat, etc. But you know, if you've got, say, a family who are vegan or vegetarian and They've, the child's been on lots of antibiotics and they haven't done the probiotics, they could easily be very, very low in lactobacillus. So it's very, very important for building that working memory. And of course, kids that keep on repeating themselves are ones where they've forgotten that they said, or oh, their brain's working too fast and they're not retaining that memory. So they often like, you know, you, you have the kids that ask, repeat themselves over and over again, they're always asking you the same question and you were put, you're always answering the same, same thing and it just goes on, it's like a stuck record. So that's often that. Um, and then lactobacillus is also really important for building this thing called GABA, which I talked about, which is your cool, your calm, your inner yogi. So again, if you've got a child with anxiety and they've been on antibiotics or they've had a very low dairy diet through choice or through allergies or whatever, and they haven't built in this lactobacillus, then it could be one of the causes of their anxiety. So that's what we look for in the stool testing. Um, Bifidobacterium, which is another one you will all probably heard of, um, is um, again a critical one for building this GABA. And I think GABA is such a critical, critical one for the pounders, kids, the anxiety kids, the OCD, ticky kids. They, it's, anxiety is the biggest underlying driver. And there are other things that can modulate anxiety. It may not be that, but it's something that we look for. Um, and then finally, I just want to talk about just a few nutrients that I think are really important to know about. And I, there was one question said, look, if we can't afford testing, where would you start? And I really understand that we've all got a different financial situation um, and these tests can be expensive. Just to give you a ballpark, a one test, which is the urine test is um, 335 and the stool test is between 200 and 335 as well. So it's the, so that sort of quite benchmark. So it's quite a lot of money. You're looking five, 600 pounds for the two tests. If we feel you often just do one and not the other to begin with. Um, so is, you know, uh, but as I said, we don't have to, we can help your child. You just won't get so focused if you don't do those tests and you could always save up over a few months whilst we get that baseline nutrition in. But I just want to talk about that baseline nutrition. So you've really got an idea of what you can do straight away that might make a difference. And I just want to give you clues about why you would choose one thing over another, because again, sometimes people, you know, you've got a child who is so resistant to change as it is to do you know a change could be a big wow just to get one supplement in a, in a month and i really appreciate that 
So one of the most critical ones that we put in and we find incredibly helpful for almost all these presentations and occasionally it's not appropriate, but again, that's where the consultation would be very helpful to understand whether it's right or wrong. But basically it's, it's a mineral called zinc. And zinc is unfortunately in a lot of foods that the children don't particularly like eating. So the big one is oysters. Now, how many kids have oysters for supper every week, <laughs> every night? It doesn't happen. It's in seafood as well. And again, people have been slightly gone off seafood. We might have the occasional prawn. Um, it's, in, it's, in, uh, it's in fish, but again, lots of kids are very keen on fish or they'll only have a little bit of cod like fish fingers, but they won't have salmon and things like that. Um, it's also in a little bit in milk, but again, if they're dairy free or you've got, you know, decide to have oat milk, whatever, there's not going to be much. So it's in nuts and seeds, again, if you've got a nut allergy kid or they don't eat that kind of thing. So zinc deficiency happens very, very, very easily in kids. Um, so that's, you've got a picky eater, they're probably low in zinc. And the signs that a child's low in zinc are, this is not a scientific sign of, at all, but it's just a little clue. And we sometimes use it just to lead us down the pathway of whether this is right. There's little white speckles on the nails. They like little flecks. Um, and they'd need at least two or three over both hands for us to think of it significant. So if there's one, it could have been just a bash or something. But if it's quite a big, you know, lots of speckles on the fingernails, that's one sign. The other one is being a very picky eater. So the reason is because zinc helps to form a really brilliant sense of smell and taste. And remember, smell is unbelievably important for when we taste food. So obviously the sensitive kids with sensory issues and sometimes it is actually how it feels in the mouth. But if it's smell or taste, then it could be zinc. Zinc also helps to create all our digestive juices. So the kid with a very small appetite, the very skinny one, um, is probably you need zinc to produce your hydrochloric acid in your stomach and your pancreatic enzymes to break down all your foods into the building blocks, your gallbladder. So it's need for, for all those. Zinc also really helps with diarrhea. So um, there have been lots of studies with giving kids um, zinc and their diarrhea has gone. So it's very healing on, this, on the gut. So if the gut's out of zinc, it's a good one to have. Um, zinc helps you think. So it's very, very important for that brain. It's, I mean, it's just got so many actions, but it's very good at modulating the brain. There is a condition that we do test for sometimes called cryptopyral, when uh, the child is in a situation where it's, it's a genetic condition um, and the, we would look at family history, but it, basically you pee out more zinc and B6 than you can possibly eat in a diet, even in a really, really, really healthy diet. Um, and it can happen due to genetics and other environmental issues. Um, and there's often in the background quite a lot of depression and you know, bipolar and autoimmunity go back in the family. Um, lots of very pale skin, they call it the China doll syndrome. Um, so they often don't tan very easily. That was just often very beautiful skin, you know, very, very pure, like sort of, you know, like, like, like China. Um, and they often find it very difficult to concentrate and a little bit anxious and things. Anyway, but that's another, you know, a zinc thing that we go in with a little bit higher levels than we'd normally go. But also zinc's really important for the immune system. So if your child's always getting coughs and colds or they're the pandas kids that, you know, will get this awful inflammation surge, um, from um, having an infection, then we need to work on the zinc. So zinc's really cool. Now, how do you get zinc in? Um, every child's different, obviously. Um, I, we usually start um, with about 15 milligrams, unless they're tiny, tiny, tiny kids. Um, but we often don't see tiny, I mean, for you know, this kind of presentation, they tend to be a little bit older. Um, and if we haven't tested, we get 15 milligrams to begin with. And that can be in little tiny drops that don't taste of anything. The most amazing thing is they can't taste the zinc until they've got enough in their system. So if they get, this tastes a bit funny, mum, then it might be that they've actually got enough zinc in their system. But if they, I mean, you can put it in the water or some juice and they wouldn't even know. You can actually put it in food. So any mineral you can cook with. So you could literally put it in their spag bowl and squeeze it in. They wouldn't even know it was there. Um, so it's, unless they literally just have dry food, but even that, they often like water with, a, you know, with apple juice or something, you can put it in. So that is the easiest um, one. Um, and the one I particularly like, it's called Super Zinc by Metabolics. It's just because it's really easy to give. Biocare also do little tiny zinc drops, which are good. And they've got a bit of vitamin C in them. Um, then there's the chewable ones. So there's if they're kind of really, everything has to taste like a sweet. There's a brilliant brand called Animal Parade um, and it's called Kid Zinc. 
um, and it's got some ginger and some something called olive leaf extract, which is really good for the sort of mouth and sort of infections and things. And um, that's really yummy. They're, they're like in little animals and they're chewy and they're really, really sweet. And then if you've got kids that can swallow capsules, um, zinc capsules are tiny, tiny, tiny. I mean, they're really, really weeny. So it, it's a good starting block if your child isn't, um, you know, you think they could probably swallow a raisin or they could swallow something. It's, it's an easy one to start off with. And then you can get higher, higher doses in with that. Just to share with you, and this is not meant to be me making loads of money out of this at all, but we do have an online dispensary called nature.shop and all these things are on there. So, um, so you can buy them yourself. So it's just that what we did was we decided, everyone was asking us all these questions all the time. So we set up an online shop with my sort of best of the best supplements so that they're all there in one place and they're easy to find. So that's just to share with you where you can get them from. And it's, it's just nature.shop online. Um, so zinc is a goodie. Magnesium is amazing. I love magnesium so much. Magnesium is needed for at least 600 functions in the body. But critically for your kids, um, it tends to really help the very highly wired, stressed, anxious child. The one that can't sleep, the one that can't poop, the one that's very constipated. So a child that's very hypermobile, very bendy. So the very, very bendy, bendy, bendy kids um, tend to need a lot of magnesium. Um, magnesium can come in in two ways. So if they're, again, very fussy, would really struggle to get magnesium in, then you, there's something called Epsom salt baths. And Epsom salt baths are basically magnesium sulfate, and you put two cups in a warm bath, and they soak in the bath for 20 minutes. They can play, they can have their siblings in there. Most people benefit. My children always had Epsom salt baths. It helps to detox some of the toxins from the, from, from the, from the system as well. I think they're brilliant. My daughter's very... When she was little, she said, I always have happy dreams when I have an Epsom salt bath. And then um, she's very sporty now. So if she does a big event, um, then she will come back and have a big Epsom salt bath and it stops her having injuries and things. I love them. They really help me if I'm really wired to get to sleep. They're just lovely. So it's really good. You do it before bed and it just helps the kids wind down. It's not quite so easy when it's boiling hot. So this week's probably not a good time to start because you do get quite hot from being in the bath for 20 minutes. Um, but maybe when it's cooled down again, you could try that. Um, and then there are um, magnesium sprays that you can spray on their skin, um, which are lovely, and that can really help. They don't tend to be very strong, but at least it's something. Um, you can get um, magnesium, this um, Floridex or magnesium liquid, which is pretty good. And again, the Animal Parade do this chewable magnesium, which are little tiny animals, so they're quite cute and quite sweet. So again, you know, you can get magnesium in. So the only real side effect from having lots of magnesium is a loose bowel. So if they develop, if they've got very runny tummy anyway, I probably wouldn't start with magnesium. But if they're more on the constipated side or they sit on the loo for an hour at a time, which lots of kids do, they literally just, I don't know what they do there, but they like, you know. So they say they're not constipated, but it's happening, but it's still really hard to come out. You know, or if it comes out like sort of conkers, or it's very sort of ropey rather than smooth things like that, or they've got a history of constipation, the magnesium's really helpful. And as I said, the hypermobility can be a big thing. So magnesium's fab. Um, vitamin D. Now, we've probably all heard a lot about vitamin D recently because they found that those with, um, who've suffered worse from COVID or sadly passed away were ones, uh, people with very low vitamin D status. If you have dark skin um, and live in England, it's damn hard to get enough vitamin D on its, on, from the sunshine. We had a terrible, terrible, you know, it started raining in August last year. So we missed out on the lovely sun in August and September. So our, and we only store it for about three months. So basically by November, we were all deficient unless we take it through the winter. And I, I suspect that the government are reviewing the levels that they've advised. They've always sort of said 400 IU for kids and a uh, thousand IU for adults. And actually they're realizing that those with dark skin, or those that spend a lot of time inside. So, you know, the pandas kids often live in their bedrooms or in their bathroom washing their hands. You know, they're not outside enough, you know, so they're often not getting enough vitamin D. Vitamin D is very anti-inflammatory. Um, and it's also very important for the immune system. It's important for bones, obviously, but that's less relevant to you guys. But vitamin D in itself can really, really help if your child is prone to infections, they've got the pandas type picture where they're getting very inflamed. But as I said, it's this general anti-inflammatory. It also feeds the microbiome. So it's like a probiotic. So it's really, really critical to get vitamin D in. And 
optimal level. So if your child did have a blood test with a doctor, which is actually really hard to get these days, um, it used to be much easier, but they sort of you know, cut costs. And so we, we can do it privately. I think it's about 35 pounds, but it's a fingerprint. So they have to be brave enough to you know, squeeze it out. It's not a hard one to do, but you know what I mean? Some kids won't do that. Um, but um, we, your aim at the moment, the sort of threshold for the government sort of 50, 60 is sort of, you know, just about okay. But we look to try and get the level to about 100, 110, because it's thought that those are the levels that are the most anti-inflammatory. Any more can actually not really make any difference. And you don't want it over 200 anyway. So we aim to get to about 100, 110. Um, and we find that that can make a massive difference to their presentation. Um, so that's vitamin D. And then there's omega-3. Um, omega-3 is a fish oil. So I'm a very big fan of everyone eating lots of um, oily fish. Um, so that could be two or three servings of oily fish a week, which could be salmon, mackerel, um, sardines, pilchards, etc., trout, even prawns. Um, and that could be a mackerel pate or a trout pate, you know, just make some cream cheese and a bit of dill or a bit of parsley, you know, a bit of lemon juice. It doesn't need to be complicated. You can buy it too. It doesn't have to, you know, actually most of those pates are okay. You know, they haven't got that many odd ingredients in there, so they're not too highly processed. So you can think about that um, and try and serve fish as much as possible, you know, during the week. But if your child really hates fish, you're vegetarian or, you know, they have an allergy or something, or just, you just know you're not going to win on that. You know, you might do it for two weeks and then they get bored because um, <laughs> they often do. Um, then there are fish oil supplements you can get. Um, and for the little ones, there's one called Superhero by Bear Biology, which is lovely and strong. It's a mild lemon flavor and it can go in orange juice or tropical juice or mango. Or, I mean, gosh, we put it in ice cream, we put it in all sorts of things. Or they can take it through a syringe and that works pretty well. There's a more adult one, which they call Lionheart, um, which again is that. And then you can get chewables and all sorts of ones. But you can email me. Um, the best one for the shop is um, support at nature.shop. Um, and you can just email me and I'll, I'll reply to you if you, you know, want to know what's right for your child. Uh, but omega-3 is important right from the start. So if you are pregnant or you are having another baby, um, or you've got a little one, then really focusing on that, you know, right from the start. And I think we can all benefit from fish oils. There's an amazing guy called Professor Michael Crawford. He's in his late 80s and he's still lecturing. Just he's the godfather of omega-3. He's written so many papers on it. And there's an amazing doctor at Oxford University called Dr. Alex Richardson. And she again lectures all day long. She's incredible. Um, she's got a brilliant website and it's called Food for, for the Brain. Fab research, basically, FAB research, and there are thousands of papers on there linking dyslexia, dyspraxic plans, you know, uh, autism, the whole lot with a lack of fish oil. And it's not the only piece of the puzzle, as I said, you can see it's really complicated, but it's something that you could consider doing. And as I said, diet first, but if diet is a stumbling block, then there are other options. Um, and the last thing I just want to mention, just because lots of you do have um, kids with ticks and so forth. Um, there's a brilliant supplement. You know, I was talking earlier about glutathione, it's a master antioxidant that stops us from getting all inflamed and autoimmune in the first place. Um, it's actually, glutathione is actually quite a difficult thing to supplement. Um, it tastes disgusting. You can, there is a lotion you can get, but it's not very effective. Lots of kids can't tolerate it, etc. But one step before, so I was talking about a really complicated process from the B12 and folate all the way through. But one step before is this thing um, called N-acetylcysteine or cysteine, okay? And so N-acetylcysteine comes in berry flavoured, lemon flavoured, apple and cinnamon flavoured, lots of lovely sort of powders and things like that. And they go well in juice and so forth. It's much better tolerated. But what's really, really interesting is the research that's been done on this has found it reduces repetitive behaviours. So, and obviously ticks and Tourette's are repetitive behaviours. So it's the one thing that's had the most research in terms of ticks and Tourette's and sort of where, or, you know, uh, just where kids just keep on being on repeat, they're like a stuck record. Um, and um, so it's something that we often find really benefits. And it's that working on that glutathione pathway, which is exciting because it's, it's going to help them systemically to reduce that inflammation. So that's me chatting away. Now we've got one question in the chat room. My daughter's never burped, Lucinda. Her doctor has no idea why. She has autism and development late. Any thoughts? So I've got sort of two ideas on this. Um, I haven't had this question before, so it's interesting. 
Um, so what's very interesting is that we all need a lot of hydrochloric acid in our stomach to break down protein. Um, it's that acid that we, you know, when you have a reflux, it comes up and it's, it's pretty horrible. And it's, it's meant to be really, really acidic. It's meant to have a pH of two and a half or below to protect you from infections. But a lot of people end up with a very um, low level of hydrochloric acid. It tends to be very watery. So often we ha you can't test little kids with this, but basically you can do a little sort of cotton thing down the throat and test for their HCL. It's a pretty gross thing to do. But, and so as I said, I don't get the kids to do this, but um, it comes out that their pH is closer to water. So there's just not enough acid in there. And what's very interesting is that when you start adding in, um, so what's meant to happen is if you get your child to drink some bicarbonate of soda, just a pinch in a glass of water, they should burp for Britain within a minute because it's meant to fizz with the, with the acid in the stomach. So what I would do, um, Hawaii, um, is to try to put some bicarbonate of soda in her water it could be in her food it could be in a cookie or something like that using it and just see if you but she but if she doesn't then we need to get more acid into her stomach so we need to think about lemon juice or apple cider vinegar now that you know lemon juice squeeze onto food just before you serve it or um, a little dressing or something like that we i put lots of i put vinegar for instance in our bolognese so i try and get vinegar in in different ways it doesn't have to be like raw raw um and just and then and build that up and just see if she starts belching because it might be something to do with stomach acid. Anyway, I hope that answers that one. Um, what if a child needs to be lower salicylates? Salicylates are, I think, probably low salicylate diets, probably the worst diet to follow. And that's where you will need care directly from a practitioner to get the nutrition in at the same time. For anyone that doesn't know, it's kids that are very reactive to very brightly coloured foods, um, sort of oranges and strawberries and things like that. So you think they're healthy, but they're sending them absolutely hyper. Um, but the things that are very helpful for that, uh, Lisa, is to um, Epsom salt baths are very good at reducing that phenols and the salicylates in the, in the body. So lots of Epsom salt baths. And there is a enzyme you can get from a website called Mandy Mart, and it's by Houston Enzymes and it's called no fennel. Um, and you basically give a couple of those with every single meal, and that helps to reduce the natural fennels and salicylates in the food. So try that, Lisa. Okay. Um, Susie wants to know about gluten and its impact on inflammation. So I'm from the camp that there are lots of people who can eat gluten and perfectly happy, healthy and well. However, it um, and interesting, I was talking to a lovely um, family this week and um, actually it's a couple who are about to get married and he's, he's got mild autism and um, she, she hasn't, but they've been staying with his parents over lockdown and they've been cooking everything from scratch. So they've been eating their own sourdough like everyone else has been making their sourdough. Not me, I haven't had much time. Um, um, and one day they went to, they got some buns from Lidl to have a barbecue. Um, it was the same meat they'd eaten from the same butcher all the way along. So it was, the only difference was the bun. And they both felt really, really ill and really sort of you know, painful gut and inflamed the next day. So I don't think it's all about the gluten. I think it's about the quality of the gluten. Um, so that's why we often go in with spelt and rye and barley and things rather than gluten. However, if you've got a family history of autoimmunity, so autoimmune thyroid, diabetes, celiac, or gluten sensitivities. A lot of people from Ireland, from Scotland, Scandinavia are very intolerant of gluten or, you know, or you know, wheat anyway. So if that's the case, then we might well test for, um, to see whether gluten's a problem um, from an autoimmune perspective or an inflammatory perspective, which tends to be a blood test. There is one urine test, which is brilliant. It tests for um, milk and gluten to see whether they're causing this opioid effect in the brain, making them sort of quite addicted. So the, food, the kids that are really, really addicted to just eating, to, you know, the ones that only eat cheese and pasta, because <laughs> it's milk and uh, are often these peptide kids, but that's a different story. So I hope that helps, Susie. I think that um, a lot of kids do respond to a gluten-free diet, but I'd only want to do it for a few weeks to see. I wouldn't want to stick 
there's I think historically there's been this thing you have to stick to six months otherwise you're not going to see any change and these poor parents are doing gluten-free 100% seeing no change in their child for six months and then they carry on and carry on and carry on thinking they haven't seen any change and we go no it's obviously not the thing um, and um, so it's, it doesn't work for everybody um, and then we've got Gwen to ask about NAC for children who not take tablets please so there's as I said these powders so there's a um, uh, it does need to be practitioner prescribed that's the only thing with these ones but there's a berry a, sort of a nice dark berry flavored NAC there's an apple and cinnamon one and there's a sort of lemon and lime one so one you know we can get that but I don't think it tastes too bad so you can open up the capsules and you could mix it in and my tip for anybody whose kids will eat anything that's like smooth like a yogurt or a fruit puree or some ice cream is to use that as your method of getting a lot of these supplements in. And what I like about capsules is they're the right, exactly the right quantity that your child needs. And you can tighter up, so you can start with quarter of a capsule, or half a capsule. So you can really, you know, if they're very sensitive, you're a bit worried about the taste or reactions or anything, you can go in very slowly building those up. Um, whereas, um, but I mean, most of the powders do come with a certain size scoop, so it is possible. But anyway, just say, don't be frightened of capsules. You don't want a big tablet, because tablets are a pain to grind up and hide, they're much harder. But tablets are great, and you can put them in Nutri Bullet, you know, whizzing up with their, with their juice or whatever. It's amazing how you can hide these things. Um, so, someone said, Could you spell out the last supplement you mentioned in relation to glutathione? This is this NAC, N acetylcysteine. Um, it's great stuff. Um, okay, so, Amory. Uh, my daughter's having post mycoplasma pneumonia infection, the worst pants that ever. Oh, God. Mycoplasma is horrendous. Um, I want to request a repeat blood test, but they don't know what to ask for. The symptoms of, okay. Profound ticks, urinary frequency, anxiety, tummy ache, any advice? Um, so, again, my team can organize mycoplasma. So, we can do all the atypical pneumonias. So, mycoplasma, you know, pneumonia. There's chlamydia pneumonia, there's um, all these different pneumonias we can check for. We can check for strep, we can check for um, Epstein-Barr, so all the really inflammatory viruses and things. So um, definitely one of my team. So I, I, I think I said to most of you earlier, I've got a team of six specialists who special, specialise in my team, specialise in neuropsychiatry. So if it's not me, I have got a bit of a waiting list. It makes October for me, just because I've written this book and it's just it literally just gone to the publisher. So I've like all my 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 diaries just got really stacked up. Um, so but I've got, as I said, Sophie, Susie, Lisa, um, Lucy and um, Katie, who are and yes, yeah, so I say Sophie. Yeah, all, they're all amazing. They're all brilliant. And we all work together. We all mentor each other. We work on every single case together. So you will get input from me if it's not me. Um, anyway, we can request those blood tests. Um, the labs are still open. The ones that we tend to use is London-based, Guildford-based, um, there's one in Andover. So there are only a few paediatric phlebotomists, but who are very good at these poor pandas kids. And, um, you know, there's one that will come out to sort of just around the M25, but not much out of the M25. So, um, and so if you're able to come into London, if you're miles away, I know it'd be a really tough journey, but um, it, it is possible. And the, generally the phlebotomists we use are lovely, so we can do that. Um, yes, um, so yeah, someone asked about the glutamate nutrient, as is an N-acetyl, A-C-E-T-Y-L, cysteine, C-Y-S-T-E-I-N-E. -E. But if you Google N-A-C, you'll probably get it. Um, is eating very slowly likely to be related to inflammation at all? So um, I think um, sometimes it's maybe because it, you know, their belly's a little bit sore. Maybe they just feel uncomfortable when they're eating. They might feel uncomfortable swallowing. So it's just working out a pattern to um, why you feel they're eating very slowly. Um, sometimes it's purely because they're distracted and hyper and they're not very good at sitting still and they're just not focused because they're not interested in the food. And it may be zinc because zinc's a big one to actually say, as they give them a better sense of smell and taste, help their digestive juices, make them feel more hungry so they're more likely to sit down. Um, but what we often do is to say, look, well, let's, let's set a time, timer for 30 minutes because then I probably only going to have one or two mouthfuls after that. And then rather than sitting around for an hour and a half waiting for them to finish, because then mealtimes just merge and they're never quite hungry enough because they're just... Ugh. So anyway, it's less stress for everybody. Okay, so 
Why is gluten and dairy nearly always eliminated in diets for children with autism? And when do you say enough is enough and actually it's okay for them to have it? So I explained a little bit about that just now. Um, so what we tend to do is this peptide test, the urine test, as I said, to see whether the um, gluten and casein and all casein is driving an inflamed brain. Um, and it's a very easy test to do. It's about 50, 50 pounds, 50 euros. So it's not a huge amount of money. Um, and it will give us a clue whether your child needs to be on that diet. Occasionally, we find that they still show peptides, even though they're on a very strict diet. And sometimes because it's creeping in in a, in a way, and you know, whatever. But it just gives us an idea. And I, as I said, I think it's, there's so much research. There's a lovely guy called Paul Shattuck, who must be in his late 60s. And he's been researching this at Sunderland University since the 70s. So he's got, you know, that's, and he's gone to almost every autism conference and he's spread the word about it. So this is why the gluten and dairy comes up. But there's also this um, amazing setup in, a, in, a, in America called the Autism Research Institute. And they've looked at all the biomed approach, so all the vitamins and minerals and nutrition and diets. And they've literally asked every single person that has reached them to fill in a form to say what has helped their child the most. And it comes up that gluten and casein free diet tends to be the one that is one of the highest you know, um, interventions that makes the biggest difference. But if it's not help your child, then it, it, it may not be that and you may want to think of something else and it may not be the diet at all. And sometimes it's about getting the diet broader rather than narrower. Okay, so we've got Corey. Is there anything you recommend for a five-year-old boy who's recently developed ticks? eats very well and sleeps well and we aren't sure where to start. So um, what you need to think about is when did this start? When did the tick start? Was, did he have a cold? Did he have a cough? Did he have gastroenteritis? Did he have a fright? You know, was there, you know, I mean, obviously during lockdown, there's been a big change in children's lives and I think that that may impact on them. So there's stress as well. It's not just nutrition, it can be stress as well. But I would probably think about, for ticks, I would probably start with some magnesium and then maybe after a couple of weeks, think about the NAC and see if that helps. Because if the diet's good and sleep's good, I'd probably start with those and see, see if it makes any change. And if not, do Britain with one of my team. Um, now, Nikita, my daughter's not allergic to dairy and gluten, but has been tested for inflammation and she's intolerant to dairy, not gluten. Should we continue with gluten? You notice change in her behavior every time you give gluten. So the biggest benchmark is, is there a negative change or a positive change from eating gluten? So if there's a negative change, then there will be, there are so many tests. You could spend thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds on testing dairy and gluten and still not know the real answer. And it may be that she's reacting now, but she might not react in six months time. And I always, I have a saying that it's not the food's fault and it's actually something to do with the gut. And maybe you haven't done the right test or she's just saying, it's not suiting me right now, um, but it might further down the line. So if she is reacting to the gluten, keep it out for now um, and try it again in a few months. Um, so I phoned her on. Recommended um, probiotics, please. Um, is FOSS not a good idea? As my son has headache and nausea after one with FOSS and bifidobacteria. Interesting. So FOSS is a prebiotic. So it's the food that feeds the probiotics of the bugs in the gut, okay? And it can um, cause a lot of bloating, it can cause a lot of gas. So a lot of kids don't do very well on that. Um, I would go in probably um, um, with a lactobacillus only FOS free probiotic to begin with and see whether they tolerate that. So you might want to just go in with a tiny baby one like by Gaia, which is very well tolerated and it's dairy free and everything. And just literally start one drop and then two drops. And if that's well tolerated, then you can go to a lactobacillus only probiotic. And if you email me, I'll tell you which one because there, there are plenty, but I'd want to know how she, he got on with the Biogaia, which is B-I-O-G-A-I-A. -A -A. And it's hugely research. It's very good for colic. It's very good for you know, sore tummies for babies and things. So it's a really gentle one. Um, would I recommend a specific probiotic for inflammation or ticks? As I said, we are so used to, in our clinic, doing the stool test and finding out what's going on in the microbiome to begin with. So we very much put in the probiotics for what they're missing, if you see what I mean. Um, but if you haven't got the funds to do, do any testing, then um, one of my favorite probiotics for this presentation, well, there are two really. Um, one is called Simprove, 
Um, and Simprove is a um, <clears throat> liquid probiotic. Get the mango and passion fruit flavor because the original is really gross. So just to let you know, mango and passion fruit one is the one that will win with the kids. And you can mix it in orange juice and you can mix it in tropical juice. So there's, um, you know, you, you know, it doesn't need to be on its own, even though it says on the bottle it should be. We've, I've spoken to them and they've done tests and they said it does work with some juice, so it's okay. Um, so that's a good one because it's liquid. Um, the other one that you can consider is someone called Ecodophilus, Echodophilus by um, Bionutri. And that's got no fast, but it has got some um, bifidose. So I would probably go with the biogar to begin with. But Simprove is bifido free, so it's just lactobacillus. Uh, Jay, would you um, say, Caroline, regards to vegetarian diet, what are your views on corn, toffee, etc.? So I, I'm not a great fan of corn, I would say, because if you look at the ingredients, I mean, I think the plain corn is okay. But the, if you look at the ingredients, there are many, many, many ingredients on that label that you would not call food. They are definitely chemicals that have been put in rather than food, so they're synthetic. But I'm, you know, big fan of tofu if you're vegetarian, because um, try and get organic if you can. Um, there's companies like Clear Spring and so forth now. There's one called Two Foo, I think. And they do, a, uh, they do a tempeh and tofu. And that's got lots of calcium and it's got iron um, and so forth. So I think that's a really good option. Um, um, remember that the vegan and coconut yogurts and um, plant-based um, milks might be very good to use in cooking because they have a very similar texture, but they don't have any calcium, etc. in there. So um, you do need to be careful. Or it's very minimal, or sometimes it's just calcium carbonate or something like that. It's not very good quality calcium that's gone in, or the vitamin D levels are quite low and things. So, um, uh, um, okay, when it comes to meat, which is the best to buy organically when you're on a very tight budget? Um, what I would do is to go and find your local butcher someone that's really lovely that you can trust and get the best quality meat you can. So that would be meat that has been grass fed rather than um, fed on corn and, um, and basically feed rather than grass. So if you can do that and to try and get sort of the cuts that are a bit cheaper, so something like skirt rather than steak, for instance, and mince is pretty good. So that's why bolognese and meatballs are great. Um, chicken, um, again, um, I think, that unless you get it from a butcher where you really know this, the provenance, I would probably go for organic. Um, and, you know, we tend to buy one, one chicken a week and I tend to you know, roast it and then I make stock from it. And, you know, we use it for three or four meals. So it's actually quite efficient. Um, um, and even though it looks quite a lot of money when you actually buy it, um, it works out at quite a lot of meals. Um, so I was asking about magnesium, what type and how much. Um, I... For a kid with ticks and so forth, I'd be looking at least 400 milligrams a day. And when we do the tests, it usually highlights 600 milligrams. So it's quite a lot. But it's build up slowly because um, it can cause a little bit of loose stool. So if they've got loose stool, then you're just a little cautious with magnesium. The magnesium type I particularly like, um, it's not so easy. It does come in capsules rather than in nice kiddie friendly stuff is magnesium bisglycinate or bisglycinate, B-I-S-G-L-Y-C-I-N-A-T-E. Um, there's a great company called um, Metabolics and it's 133 milligrams per capsule. And again, you just put the, open up the capsules and put them in some fruit juice or yogurt or whatever, or um, thick smoothie or fruit puree or something. Um, and that's probably the level you need. But there are a lot, um, there's also a magnesium phospholipid, which has got these lovely brain phospholipids, which are really good for the you know, brain cells to connect. So you need to think about that too. But I would start with glycinate if you, if you want to. Is Saccharomyces boulardii a good probiotic for children in antibiotics? Um, Sac boulardii is a cousin of a probiotic. It's not actually a probiotic, but it acts in a similar way. It's actually a yeast, but it's a yeast that our bodies need and it helps with leaky guts, um, and it helps with diarrhea. So the loose bowel is the presentation. Again, we check for need for sacroiliac in the stool testing, and we use it quite a lot in our, in our clinic. Um, I would say if your child needed antibiotics, I, if they have runny tummies, then definitely SACB, but I'd probably go with another probiotic, um, unless their stool test is particularly highlighted, they need SACB. Um, the last one, is there any typical deficiency or issue associated with sudden presentation of disturbing intrusive thoughts? Seven-year-old child with ASD diagnosis, looking at 
um, PP, but interested in nutritional approaches. So a nutrient I haven't talked about, and I'm just going to talk about it really briefly. And it sounds really controversial when I say it, because it's called lithium, and everyone associates lithium with bipolar disease. But lithium is actually a natural mineral that's in the ground. It's in our food chain. Um, it's in water, and, but it's not in everybody's water. So some water supplies are better than others, and it really depends you know, about the mineral source from you know, where, it's, where the water's come from. Um, lithium used to be added to 7-Up before, um, this is ages and ages ago, but the original 7-Up had lithium in it. <laughs> and that's why I made everyone really cheery. And the reason why lithium's so important is because it acts like the school bus transporting B12 and folate around the body. So you can have blood tests where you've got loads of B12, loads of folate, but if you don't have enough lithium, then um, it won't transport around the body. But what we find, we do a hair test to check for lithium levels. And it's usually on the floor with these kids. And um, we just get a little bit of lithium drops in and it's very, very, very low dose. It just, you know, it's not scary, big dust stuff like medicines at all. It really is a tiny amount. And that seems to be unbelievably good at this sort of disturbing, intrusive thoughts, violent behaviours, you know, where everything is very extreme. So it's kind of, you think, you know, disturbing, intrusive thoughts is that sort of same sort of bipolar presentation where everything's sort of, you know, um, all schizophrenia, you know, you've got these sort of, so even though he hasn't got that or her, um, it's, um, it's still the thing to think about. Um, and just lots of magnesium and calming things as well. Um, would you re re recommend Remag for magnesium? I don't know Remag, Jade. Um, I don't know that one specifically, um, but most magnesium is pretty good. It's just whether it's tolerated by the bowel. If it causes a loose bowel, you need to sort of change it up to something like brisket snake, which is very well tolerated. Bex, any ideas about extreme flushing red cheeks after activity? So red cheeks, red ears. We had this query about salicylates and phenols earlier, causing hyper hyperactivity. And sometimes the, um, this red cheeks and red ears can be due to some sensitivity to things like oranges, strawberries, brightly coloured fruits and vegetables. And it's something we could definitely investigate if you associate it with hyperactivity or with autism, etc. Corinne, um, I've used magnesium oil on my daughter for 80 legs, but she plays it stings and sometimes her skin looks red. Is this normal? Unfortunately, it is normal. And that's why I normally recommend um, Epsom salt baths instead because it doesn't have that effect. So that's why I prefer it. But as I said, some people don't have a bath and so they need to use the oil. But there's a junior one you can get, a junior magnesium oil with some lavender, which is less itchy. So you could try that. But some kids are just too sensitive and that's why you need the Epsom salts. You can, from some websites like Mandy Mark, get Epsom salt creams, um, which are okay. They're pretty good. So you could try that and it doesn't seem to itch. So if that's the only way of getting it in, then, uh, then do try an Epsom salt cream. It's not known to magnesium sulfate cream. Um, okay, Shira wants to know about oxalates. So oxalates are the little crystals that cause kidney stones but they can also be all around the body. So they can be in the brain, they can be in the heart, they can be in the gut, they can be all over the place. And it's often driven by very high yeast overgrowth, um, but it can cause a lot of urination. So we often have kids, like Panda's kids that come in and they've gone to the loo 11 times during their first consultation. Um, and they don't go for, you know, it's not like they're peeing that much, but you know, they're desperate to go. And it's those kids that you know, start wetting themselves or um, they've never been dry through the night. Um, often they're um, also they tend to eye poke quite a bit and they often look to the side and very sort of, very sort of itchy eyes and things like that is often oxalated kids. There's a diet, um, a low oxalate diet, which is very, very punishing. I would say it's something I don't like putting a child on. So sometimes we, we lower the oxalates to begin with rather than get the full extreme. And the higher oxalates foods are things like spinach, almonds, raspberries, beetroot. Um, so, you know, it's not a big, big thing to begin with, but um, for some kids, because they eat those foods anyway, but getting very into the oxalate diet can be quite, quite punishing. But we do the urine test. I was talked about the one test earlier, but the, um, it's a similar one. It's almost exactly the same. It's just slightly less markers. Um, is called um, the OAT test, OAT test, organic acid test, which is by Great Plains. And that has three oxalate markers. Um, but increasingly, the stool tests also have some oxalate markers because it's so linked with the, with the microbiome. So we can often test from the stool as well. So um, there are sort of two ways of doing that, Shira. So um, yeah, the signs before you do the test are basically usually some sort of urination issue or the itchy sort of scratchy eyes or the sort of you know, very ticky eyes. Uh, Lisa's asking about which supplement do I recommend? 
There's a company um, called New Beginnings and they do little tiny drops and you get it from a website called Your Health Basket. Um, but um, I would test first to know that your hair, the hair test is low first. Lisbeth, lovely Lisbeth, hello. Nice to meet you at last. Um, why some kids can be very sensitive to vitamin B, like all the B1s, 2s, 3s, 6s and 12s. It's to do usually with that methylation pathway and that glutathione pathway. And what we need to do is work out where the roadblocks are along the way. And it's something um, that your lovely practitioner Susie can help you with, Elizabeth, is to untangle why, why, why they, where those blocks are and hopefully make it easier for you. Um, but sometimes you just have to get it in through food. Luckily, I, I know your case quite well and you've done incredibly well on the diet. So they should be getting some in. Um, Tanya, I'm sorry, I missed the majority of this webinar. Would a recording be available? Yes, it's being recorded, Tanya, and um, we will put it on the, the link on Facebook later. Um, is CBD oil advised for ticks? Um, I'm afraid as a naturopath, I am totally stuck between a rock and a hard place when it comes to CBD because I'm not a doctor and I'm seeing kids with autism. I'm seeing kids with seizures. And of course, those are medical conditions that CBD can help. And so I, and actually right now, I don't know any doctor that will give those to those kids in the UK either. I, there's a question mark over a couple, you know, a couple of epilepsy doctors who are sort of thinking about it, but it's still, there's been big dragging of heels on that. So I'm afraid it's something I can't help with, Caroline. But what I can do is that there are other supplements that work on the same pathways. So there's something called P, P-E-A, which is a fantastic systemic anti-inflammatory and it works on that cannabidoid system and it doesn't seem to have any side effects. So, um, and it's very natural. And so we tend to go in with that. Um, and if they respond to that, then they would probably respond to CBD. So we, it would give us a clue whether that was a, you know, something to pursue with a doctor further down the line. Have I heard of the research on the grains, etc., by Dr. David Palmutter? I love Dr. Palmutter. He's got great research. He's written book, a book called Grain Brain um, and various other books. And he is just, he's really anti, well, wheat mainly and gluten mainly, but lots of grains too, very into the paleo movement. And it does suit some kids. There are kids who cannot break down those complex carbohydrates in their gut. They just are born without the ability to do that. And enzymes and things can help, um, but um, not, you know, not, 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 not to begin with. So this is why sometimes kids do go on a paleo diet or a very sort of low carb diet, because they just can't break it down. But that's something, again, we have to really look at. Um, Dr. Palmato is very keen on Cyrex testing, which is blood tests to check whether you have an autoimmune response, an autoimmune inflammatory response to gluten, to grains, to eggs, to milk. They're quite expensive. We're looking at four or five hundred pounds to do the tests, but it will give you that information of whether you need to go down the line from the Palmetto perspective. Um, and these are asked, do we test adults as well? Yes, we do. We do see, as I said, so we're a team of 14, um, six of the specialists and children with neuropsychiatric issues, but I'm seeing a 24 year old um, young man with autism tomorrow. So we do see adults, but we, because of the nice guidelines, you can't put them on a gluten-free, casein-free diet unless you have evidence about a test saying that they've got, um, um, you know, some sort of celiac or something like that. So, um, and there's just certain, we, we have to sort of gear things in a slightly different way for autistic adults. But if you want just general adults for hormones or gut health or whatever, yes, the rest of my team are brilliant at that. Um, so those are all the questions. There was one lady who wanted to know about histamine restricted diet, and I'm not sure she's on this call, but in case she listens later. Um, and I do have a little bit of information about her child's background. Um, so I'm just going to say this out to, to you. I'm not going to mention the name. Um, but basically, she said, my daughter's on a histamine restriction diet. You're another practitioner. She doesn't eat much meat, and we're finding awful with that eggs, cheese, yogurt, avocado, pineapple, and berries. A low, um, so one thing I didn't really talk about too much is that allergies, so a histamine picture of sneezing and itching and so forth, and um, sort of welts and ra you know, raised sort of hives and urticaria can be a, one of those pro-inflammatory pro systems in the body that can drive inflammation. Um, and um, so sometimes the kids do need to go on a low histamine diet to begin with, but we try and make that quite short term to stabilize things 
and we use supplements to stabilize because otherwise we find it very, very hard for them to have. It's basically quite an unhealthy diet. It's lots of white grains and, you know, and, and I mean, there's lots of things like apples and red peppers and um, red onions and things, but they're not very kiddie friendly. So it's, it's, it's a quite a hard one. So we try and really stabilize that histamine response as much as possible rather than taking too much away. But, um, you know, uh, there are lots of low histamine websites with recipes if you've got, you know, if you've got a child that will eat a broad range of foods. Um, so just see if anything else. Um, so there's a girl aged eight, nearly nine, just playing ticks for the last five years. Um, and they really happen when she's uncomfortable, overwhelmed, anxious. Um, and um, they don't point them out to her because um, they don't like her to hear it. But, you know, and they change quite a lot. And this is what ticks tend to do. They tend to sort of change to, from, you know, grunting to, you know, itching the nose to, I don't know, eye blinking, all sorts of different things. Um, and so what I would do is to do the full work up to find out what's driving this in the first place and really think, you know, could this be a magnesium picture? Could this be an omega-3 picture? Could this be a gut picture? Could this be an immune picture? And so we sort of divide these kids and start dividing them into um, their actual um, diagnosis. So rather than saying, this child's autistic, or this child's got ADD, or this child's got tics, we're saying, what's the underlying dynamics going on in the body? Are, have we got long-term constipation? Have we got long-term eczema? Have we got long-term asthma? Um, have we got eating restrictions? Have we got lots of colds and coughs, lots of sore throats? What, you know, what, what is that underlying sort of weak point in the body? And we'd start there. Um, and rather than concentrating on the actual diagnosis. So you could come to see us with a child where you are worried about them, but you don't know what exactly is wrong yet. And we, we have not got the ability to say they're autistic. We haven't, but we can't diagnose them. But what we can say is, this child seems to have some allergies like histamine issues or this child seems to have gut issues so let's go down that route um, and very often we find when those are all you know when you get that bit fixed then a lot of the issues start melting away and I'm not talking about you know I, I think a lot of people look at people like us say oh we're trying to you know eradicate autism or eradicate these things and we're saying no, we're just trying to help the child thrive in the environment and in the body they're in. They're born very, very sensitive. So all these kids, I think, are super highly sensitive kids. They're born into the world. They're often sensitive babies who cry quite a lot, very sensitive to their environment, sensitive to the washing powder you've used or, you know, just, you know, loud noises. And, you know, they've wired like this. Um, and there are many theories why they might be wired like this. There can be predispositions, as I said, like genetics, there can be your know, mum's diet and all sorts of things like antibiotics at birth and all sorts of things you can go dig deep into. I mean, there's so much research on all of those. At the end of the day, this child has been born very sensitive. And so you've just got to acknowledge that the whole way through and be kind to them. And I think not try to put them round, round peg, square hole and vice versa, because it just doesn't happen. Um, and I just think that what you can do with the diet, what you can do with the supplements, what you can do is find out how to get them in the best place possible. Um, and sometimes magic happens and, you know, speech comes or ticks go down or, you know, they sleep better. You know, sometimes, um, you know, or, you know, kids who are super, super anxious and suddenly they're head boy, you know, and you just go, where did that come from? You know, and it's exciting. So we don't know where your child's going. We can't predict the future. And sometimes people put a lot of hard work in and we don't go very far. But I'd say that um, we try our hardest and we try and keep, you know, I know funds can be really, really tight. But we try and take, you know, no stone unturned until we find out what that sort of critical part of their metabolic pathway is or their nutrition or their gut or whatever it is or their immune system that could help them. Because I, even though people say, oh, they're childhood things, what about the adults with ticks? What about the adults with autism? Um, and what's really interesting is I, I, you know, I, I very much look at all the data and I look at the numbers coming through. And right now, the Autism Society, they basically say it's around one in a hundred adults. They check, every, they do these um, you know, surveys every seven years and they look at adult population of autism. So they say it's around a hundred, okay? 
Um, now, in Northern Ireland, which isn't too far from here, and yes, you could argue this, it's quite an impoverished area, etc. cetera, um, but um, um, they, they do their numbers every year. Um, and um, and they, check, they actually work out the numbers of children rather than adults. So, you know, because an adult, you know, you'd be 20, 20, 18. Okay, so that's 18 years ago, they would have started off life with autism. So these are kids that are being diagnosed now, and um, it's currently one in 23 children, and it's one in 15 boys. And that is too many for me. And I know there are some people who think autism is a wonderful gift, et cetera. And I do think it is if they're high functioning and have a, you know, find life easy and are happy. But a lot of kids are not easy and happy, and it can be very, very tough for everybody. And even if we're, what we're doing, is helping your child have a happier, um, they happier life. They're finding it easier to communicate, easier to sleep, eat, to have a healthy gut, to not being in pain, to you know because they get in pain when they're ticking all the time because of course they get very stiff and it, you know because their body you know it's, it's so there are lots of reasons for doing this. It's not just you know and obviously we don't know what your child's future is, but you know anyway we do our best. So there we go. Um, We've got one more question, and then um, I think what we'll do is we'll say adios um, and turn the recording off. Otherwise, I think Zoom will probably kick us out. <laughs> We've been so long, because it's 9.30 now, so it'll be an hour and a half. But the last one is, is it possible to help delay a girl's puberty via diet? I'd say via diet on its own, probably not, but it's helpful if you get them on a very... You know, reduced sugary, very, very carby diet. So you sort of reduce the carbon sugar and you reduce their exposure to plastic and you really help with the gut health. So um, that can help. Um, and we have successfully done that. So it's the most important thing is when they first menstruate rather than when they first start developing. So as long as you can delay that, as, so they tend to stop growing or you know, slow up their growth once they start menstruating. So what you want to do is to get them to a, an appropriate, you know, healthy height. Um, and so that's why one of the reasons for delaying. Anyway, that's that last question. Um, so I hope that was helpful, guys. Um, we would love to hear from you. Um, I, as I said, weekly newsletter goes out every Sunday. You can find the link on any of our website pages. You just sign up um, and uh, that's got a recipe, a health tip and a blog usually. Um, and then I do lots of Instagram and I do lots of Facebook and a bit of Twitter and a bit of LinkedIn. But um, yeah, and, it, and you know, Sarah and I are very keen. We both work with the Children's Sea Hospital. So we work with paediatricians. And that's what's really important to us is that we're integrated. Um, and it's really great now to have some doctors who really believe in what we do. Okay. I'd just like to say thank you so much. Can you hear me? I'm not sure it's gone a bit jumpy, but I just want to thank you, Lucinda, for everything that you've uh, said. I know I've got my own full page of notes for my own, <laughs> own children. And I've seen lots of people taking notes as well. So I really hope that everyone's got as much from it as what I have. And uh, yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. It's been fantastic. Well, I loved it. It's, it's odd being one way. I find it very difficult not to sort of hear what everyone's saying. But thank you for all your lovely questions and your lovely feedback. So I'm going to stop recording now.